Hello everyone and welcome back to um, my weekly summary for my um, intro to AI class. So just to go over it again, this class is taught by Professor Kalev Kask of the University of California, Irvine. And um, this is specifically um, CS171 in the winter of 2022. And so this week we're continuing we're continuing on within our search methods. So if you recall last week we went over uninformed uninformed search uninformed search methods in which we had the the breath first search abbreviated as BFS we also had depth first search abbreviated as DFS and we had a special case of this in which we had the iterative DFS and lastly we had the uniform cost search abbreviated as UCS and so now what we're going to look at let me actually shift this over make this more in the center is we're going to want to look at informed search methods. And the whole idea of informed search methods, as opposed to uninformed search methods, is that, let me use blue for this. Is that within informed search methods we're getting some type of information right it's implied within the name but what is this information so we are informed about something and specifically we're informed about how close a state is to the nearest Goal state. So this is what we're informed about within our informed search. And the information here, which I talk about, about this information about how close the state is to the nearest goal, this is what's known as a heuristic. Let me make sure I write the S a bit neater. It's a heuristic. And so that's why you may also see informed search referred to as a heuristic search, um, but just know that those terms are interchangeable. And so I think I think before moving on to the type of of uh, search search methods, Let's first discuss about what exactly is a heuristic and and what properties can these heuristics hold. So I'm gonna go over to the side here. And so when talking about a heuristic, we can best explain what a heuristic is through 
just one word. And that word is a guesstimate. It's right, this is this is I'm not sure if this is an actual word or not, but it gets used a lot. Um but it's just an estimate in which you are pretty much um guessing or or a guess that that you are approximating that you aren't certain but it's 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 approximating some some answer and so a heuristic it's pretty much guesstimating um the the remaining cost specifically from from a current state to the goal I'll say this is the current state to the goal. And so the heuristic, it's going to have its own, its own notation given to it to describe it as a function. And what we write is the letter H. So H of some state is pretty much the estimate from the state to the goal. And so and so now you can see we have we have two what we can call state functions. I'm not sure if they're actually called that um, this but remember from before we also have the term g of n or not g of n uh we have the the function g of some state right so remember we have g of state in which this is referring to to the total gain from the start to that state. And so you can see here, I'll use, I'll keep this in red. And so you can see here, if we have, let's first start with G. If we have G of some state, which is describing the start to some state, and we have h of some state, which is describing that state to, to the goal, you can see here how if we add these terms together, and given that this h term is an estimate here, then this term will give us the estimated total um, cost from start to goal, right? And I guess it should be important to specify um, passing some state and that state is the one that we're specifying here right because if I'm saying that I know the total value from my start to the state and I'm giving an estimate from the state now to the goal I'm basically saying okay if I go from the start to the goal passing the state my total estimate will be the sum of like these two and so what we do um, how we how we define this this summation of these two terms is by the function f f of some state is equal to g of some state plus h of some state and we can say this f of some state is this definition here the estimated total cost from the start to the goal passing some state which is the state is given here and so if you wanted 
some way to remember maybe like why is it f why, why why do we call this estimated total cost from the start to the goal passing some state why do we call it f um give it the function i guess letter f there isn't really a clear reasoning for it um at least not that i know of but a way that can maybe help you remember that can help that helps me remember is this f letter stands for the final like the final cost that you'll end up with passing the state that that we pass here and so just to kind of reiterate the g here we can say this is the game and this is an actual value so it's, it's, it's a, val a value in which we actually calculate and is known for h here this is our heuristic in which remember the heuristic is just a guesstimate and so this is just an estimated value and for the f here this is the final in which since we are adding an actual with an estimated term then the estimated term must then kind of override the value and since not not all terms are actual values then that means the whole thing is just is just an estimate and so we have this this final term in which this this or final value i should say and this final value itself is an estimate right because we don't know the actual cost from uh from going from the state to the goal all right cool so now moving on from that um, from there let's let's look more into this heuristic right because this is something that's that's new to us we haven't seen this before and and there are a lot of things to consider within this heuristic and so let's look into what properties that this heuristic uh or what properties can heuristics have before jumping into that there's one thing I, 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 I do want to mention first, and and it's that heuristics, let me write this in blue here. Heuristics are solution costs to simplified versions of the problem. All right, problem right there. This is an important thing to know. Because we want a heuristic, right? We want it to be an estimate, right? We, we, we don't want to the whole purpose of the heuristic is to give us a good idea of what's maybe the the better path to to look down first right and so we want something that's very easy to calculate but not but it doesn't have to be something that's entirely right and so let's look at an example of of this whole idea about how heuristics should be kind of like solution cost to a simplified version of a problem and one example that's given within the text would be, I forgot the name of this game, um, but it's, it's like, it's like the, the, the sliding tile game, uh, in which you have like these numbers given here. Like, let's say this is one, eight, seven, four, Three, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And what you want is you want to put this sliding puzzle in the form such that the blank tile is on the bottom right. And then the tiles are numbered numerically, starting from the top left, 
and working your way to the right and then moving down one line. And so one possible heuristic what you would be looking at is you would you would need to decide, okay, well, my possible moves are I either slide this two up, slide this three to the right, slide this eight down, or um, slide this four to the left. Right? And so and so for each of these for for each of these possible moves, you would need some heuristic to tell you um, how close you are to getting to the solution from each of these moves. And so let's just do one example. We'll do if the two moves up. So if the two moves up, what will what will be given is this new state of the game board now, which is one, eight, seven, three, two, four, five, blank tile and six and so what we can do is we can we, we we know what the solution is going to look like we just need to know what steps we need to take to get there and so we can compare this current board to our our goal board here and so we can do that by taking the the manhattan distance which basically is the distance by only moving kind of up down left or right um, within this board pretty much reason it comes from Manhattan is because you think of it as like city blocks and in city blocks you can't if I wanted to go from one to two I can't go directly straight and you think of this as terms of city blocks in which I need to go to the right and then down so if I wanted to go from one to two instead of just going directly across and saying oh, I can get there in one tile I actually need to go one tile and then two tiles to, 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 to get there and so what I'm going to be doing is comparing each of these values to where it should be on the on the goal board. And so let's see, for one, one is kind of exactly where it needs to be, so it's gonna be zero. And I'm gonna add each of these um, differences here. And so for eight, for eight, um, eight's right here on the board. And so I need to move down two spots, right? Eight needs to go here, which is two. And let me get rid of that arrow. Two, seven, seven needs to go one, two, three, four spots. So plus four. And then next one is three. Three needs to move one, two, three spots. Two just needs to go up one, so it's just one spot away. Four needs to move two to the left, so it can end up where three currently is. Five needs to move up one, and then one to the right. So giving it two. The blank tile should move one to the right, meaning it's one off. And six needs to move one up to go here, giving us plus one. And so now if we add all these together, um, we'll get, let's see, six, four, four, two, ten, whoops, six, and 16. So the associated so the associated heuristic cost of this game board is equal to 16. And so I'm not, I'm not going to work through just for sake of time, but what you would do is you would do this same calculation. You would do it next for asking the question like Let's just ignore this two error for now for asking the question, okay, what happens if I slide this three to the right over here? And now we slot and now we we get the total heuristic cost using our same method as as from below of that. 
and we do the same thing for if we slide the 8 down, and we do the same thing for if we slide the 4 to the left. And what we would do then um, is, is based off that, that, that heuristic, that, that guesstimate, we would, we would determine which, which state to choose to search through next, depending on the cost of the, of the, of the heuristic. And so you, you might already, already tell uh, that we would actually want to look at the, at the heuristic that gives us the lowest cost, right? Because the lowest cost means we're estimating it's, it's the least amount of moves to get to that, to that goal state. But you'll see the actual us working through those search problems once we get to the, the actual search methods, the informed search methods. And so this, this simplified this, this simplified solution, um, or the solution to a simplified version of the problem, is how we figure out our heuristics, right? Because the actual problem we're given is that we have these tiles, and we can only move one tile into the dark space um, at a time. But in our simplified version here, we were just saying, okay, well, I mean, you can let's just treat it as like if you can just pick up the tile and put it where it needs to go, uh, any like anywhere on the board. And so if that was the case, then these would be the number of moves that you that you, that you need to make, which would be 16, a 16 for if you slid that two two up. And so now let's get back to looking at heuristics and the properties that they can hold. So let me just erase this real quick. All right, so now looking at our heuristic here. Let me separate this off. So heuristics can have certain properties. And there are mainly just there. Are, I should say there are only two that that um, we need to worry about. And so, the first property it can have is whether or not a heuristic is admissible. And so, for a heuristic to be admissible. We are essentially saying that it is optimistic. Or or another way we can put it is that it does not overestimate the um let me slide this over. It does not overestimate the actual path cost right and this actual path cost here is the actual path cost from going to the state to the goal which we would call h star of the state right and so and so this term is actually like is an is an actual value. It's not an estimate. This is the most efficient path from going from the goal to or my bad from going from the state to the goal. And there's really no way for us to be able to figure out h star algorithmically because if there was, then that'd be a super super efficient um, um, search. Uh, uh, search algorithm or like a, like a heuristic, but but this is just something we need to calculate by hand uh, in order to compare our our heuristic to to the generated value to the actual I guess which you can call like the best value or like the actual value. And so the definition for for our heuristic, what we say is that. Is that for each of these? Let's 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 imagine you have some state s here in the middle of this sequence, and some neighboring state s prime. 
and it's going to keep going. And you're going to have, let's see, let's go to a start state and a goal state. And so in order for a heuristic to be admissible, and what we mean when we're saying that it's like optimistic or like doesn't overestimate the actual path cost or what we call H star, what we're saying is that for all states S, the heuristic at that state must be less than or equal to H star of S. So for here, what we're pretty much saying is that pretty much when we when we say like if you're not used to this notation, um this upside down A here means like for all. So we're saying like for every possible like state that, that we have that we can that, that we can um specify the heuristic at that state s so here's just any arbitrary s here is going to be less than or equal to the h star of s the actual path cost so say we have some some actual costs going from s to the goal and here we have a generated value of of um, using our heuristic, and so what we want to say is that is that the heuristic at s must be less than or equal to the actual cost from s to the goal. And that's pretty much all all this is saying here. And by the way, I, I really like didn't mention this, but um, the star here usually just refers to like like in terms of like you can have H star of S, um, G star of S, um, in which H star of S is basically the the most optimal um, it's 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 the most optimal path from the current state s to the goal and g star of s is the most optimal path from the start to the to the um to the state s and so of course you can combine these together and you can have f star s which would be the the actual most optimal solution uh because of course um or going through s like we need we need to specify that we're going through state s and so actually let me just write that down so this is equal to most optimal path going from s to the goal and this is the most optimal path going from the start to s and then f star of s is the most optimal path going from the start to state s and then to the goal essentially just going from the start to the goal passing through state s and let me just box this because it's its own kind of separate thing but it's important notation to know for our definition for an ad admissible heuristic and so Pretty much um, a way to remember this property of admissibility 
is is by remembering that if something's admissible it means it's basically able to be admitted and and of course for something to be i guess properly identified as as a heuristic we we're saying that it must be a simp a solution to a simplified version of a problem and so of course anything that's simplified it must be it must be less than the actual solution right and so what we can really say is like admissible is like it's ad admitted if you want to think of it in 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 that sense and it's admitted uh, it's it's admitted because it is um it is um a simplified solution cost right and so and so if that helps hopefully it does if not uh that's completely fine uh, that's, that's pretty that's pretty much all this that 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 part is it's it's just maybe a way to help remember admissibility let me underline this and so the next property of a heuristic would be the um would be consistency consistent whether or not a heuristic is consistent or not and so referring back to our f term here or f function here in which remember f is equal to g plus h a, con a heuristic is consistent if within a sequence of of states we have non decreasing f values and i'll put in any sequence of states Right, and so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll redraw this above graph, uh, the state space graph down here, and I'll say we have the start, we have some state S, which has a neighboring state S prime, which then has a goal. So this is the start state. This is the goal state. And so what we want to specify, specifically just looking at the state S, is that the value from the start to state s. This is the gain. This is g of s. The value from s to the goal. This is estimated by the heuristic at s. And of course, the entire thing g of s plus h of s is equal to f of s and so looking at consistency within our example of this state space graph when we're specifying that we must have a non-decreasing f value uh, f values within a sequence of states then we're saying that this f of s here and this f of s prime here going from f s to f of s prime 
f of s prime must be the 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 the, the lowest it can be is f of s but it can be any value higher than that right we 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 want to say that f of s is less than or equal to f of s prime because the value here can be plus zero if it's if it's plus if it's plus zero then it's it's not decreasing right it's just, it's just remaining the same but it can be plus one it can be plus two it can be plus three plus four plus five um, it can be any positive integer that, that we're adding onto it it just cannot be negative right because as soon as this as soon as going from fs to fs prime uh, decreases the value then we're not satisfying consistency right because because we want to have a non-decreasing um, non-decreasing f values in any sequence and so this property where f of s must be less than or equal to f of s prime we say that this must hold for all s and s prime where we're saying s prime is the neighbor of s right and we can define this being like all neighbors of s so if we had like another s prime over here we would want to make sure that that's also a non-decreasing um, f value but we'll just stick with this simple case here and so yeah if we want to get kind of maybe better ways to to look at this consistency here we can do a little bit of of algebraic manipulation and so let's do that so here we have f of s we want it to be less than or equal to f of s prime right and so what do we know about f of s we know f of s is g of s plus h of s and the same thing for f of s prime it's still g plus h but now it's g of s prime plus h of s prime and so what we can actually do is i'm going to subtract g of s from both sides and at the same time, I'm going to subtract h of s prime from both sides. And then we'll be able to see that h of s, so this cancels, this cancels, h of s minus h of s prime must be less than or equal to g of s prime minus g of s but you might see this and be like okay well i mean what does this really do for us right we just kind of put the g's and the h's on 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 both sides but there's there's one step that we can do which will help us here we can notice that similar to how we wrote this g and h here we can do so for the s prime state here and so I'm going to write that from the start to S prime, this is G of S prime. And from S prime to the goal, this is H of S prime. And so looking at G of S and G of S prime, given that these are actual values right there's there's no uncertainty within within g of s and g of s prime because the, the, these are actual values we've calculated them as we've proceeded along we can see that if we actually were to subtract g of s from g of s prime we would be left with just this portion here which just this portion here is describing the the cost from s to s prime right and so what we can write then is we can we can say that for here i'm going to try to keep both things on the screen 
here we can say that g of s prime minus g of s, basically subtracting g of s from g, um, g of s prime, is just going to be equal to the cost. So we, we have this new function here, which is shown within the text, but I, I haven't shown it. I didn't show it in, in the previous um, review. But we have this function c, which c just stands for the cost. And so we have this cost from state s. And we'll say this action is just action A, because you might have other actions like action B or action C, um, which give you to different states. But we'll just say this is action A. And that action A leads you to S prime. Right? And so, and so now we can just think of this as just the cost from going from S to S prime. Right, and so we and so we can simplify this further to write h of s minus h of s prime must be less than or equal to the cost it takes to go from s taking action a to go to s prime. Basically, the action a brings us to to s prime. And so now this can be maybe a better way to to think about consistency right we're saying we're saying the the differences between the states right going from or the differences in the heuristics going from the states it must be it must be less than or equal to the cost it took to go from from one state to the other pretty much Pretty much the, 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 the amount we take off from from the heuristic when moving to a different state at a maximum must be the actual cost of um, of, of, of that action. But you can also move move this around uh, um, if you if you wanted and you can have something like the heuristic at the state must be less than or equal to the heuristic at S prime plus whoops. Let's go to the right, just write the cost, but this is the cost from state S to state S prime. But you can also write this as the heuristic at S prime must be less than or equal to, whoops, must be greater than or equal to HS minus the cost from S taking action A to S prime. Right, and so these are all different ways to look at consistency. Um, but of course, there is still the, the original formula, which is above right here. Just f of s is less than or equal to f of s prime. But I do believe that that even though maybe the ways in which we kind of derive these these forms of consistency, um, even even though they might be a bit confusing, there is still like great value in in seeing them written this way. And the first one, let me switch pens. The first one would be for seeing as to why we would maybe call this term like consistent in the first place right and that is given by by um, this formula right here pretty much the difference in the consistency uh, my bad the difference in the heuristics must be less than or equal to the cost. Because what we're saying is that in order for a heuristic to be consistent, it must mean that when we take a certain action, so going from S to S prime, if I say here that the heuristic at S is, it's, it, it, it's about, I don't know, maybe like 17, um, 
you'll, you'll acquire 17 more points um, but like before hitting the goal. And I say that this action costs 8 points. Then it must be the case that this heuristic here cannot, the heuristic for S prime cannot be, cannot be, um, less than if I were to take off the eight points from, from, from 17, right? This, this, this heuristic here must be less than or equal to 17 minus eight. And what that essentially gives us is, is in, I guess, an, an, an upper bound for, for how much we take off of the heuristic upon each action. And if we do have this upper bound given by like the cost of each action for the heuristic, then it's going to be consistent because then we know that we're never going to have some random scenario where, where given from S to S prime, if it only costs us one here, the heuristic might do something like haywire in which from 17, now it says the heuristic is, um, there, 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 there's only two left, right? It, cause, 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 cause we, we want, we want to say that, that going from S to S prime, if, if we're, if we're taking off one here, or if we're taking off, I guess, just any value, uh, which, which I'll call C here, then the amount we take off of the heuristic here should be about C that we take off. Right? We we, we want to take off about the same um, um, points left that we have to go. That's that's consistent with with the amount that the action costs to go from a state, one state to, to to the other. Right, and and so and so that that's that, that, that's that's one way that that we can that we can look at this. And whoops, my bad. Um, I miswrote this. We want to make sure that this is greater than or equal to 17 minus 8, right? Because we're saying that 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 we have an, an upper bound for the difference, but we have a a lower bound for the amount that the that the heuristic can can be uh, decreased by, right? So so this heuristic can be anywhere of 17, 16, 15, all the way to 10 and to nine. Pretty much we can subtract zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. So that was my bad. And additionally, in terms of what this method of writing the heuristic can can help us with is that we can also derive a very um, very useful um, um, property between between the two heuristic properties right and so we'll see that using Let's see, which one do we want to use? Using our second formula that we wrote down, we can see that 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 we can we can build up uh, um, properties about how how H S and H S prime kind of relate to each other and also how they relate to kind of H star which me bring in h star you might see how we can then connect consistency and admissibility and so let me first write this so if i first just start by writing down let me actually write this in i'll write this in purple so if i start with the goal here and I have here, uh, this will just be a state S, 
pointing is a goal. Right? So by definition, if if the heuristic is is the amount of total like cost you'll gain from going from the state to the to the goal, if we're already at the goal, then the heuristic of the goal must equal zero. Right? And so you can think of this right now as this is s prime. Right? And so using this here, we know that h of s must be less than or equal to h of s prime plus I'll just write the shorthand um, for the cost, the, the cost from going to s to s prime. Right? And so what is that cost? Well, that cost is c given here. And what else do we know? We know that h of s prime must be zero. And so we know that just assuming I should also note we're just assuming that that only if if the heuristic is just consistent, right? If the if if the heuristic is just consistent and it's following this pattern, then h of s must be less than or equal to c, right? But what is c here? If I go from s to s prime in c, that is h star of s is equal to c, right? Because the actual best case going from s to s prime is just c. So h of s is less than or equal to h star of s. But this is just one case. So, so let, 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 let's look at the next. And so if now we have this new state s, I'll call this s prime here now, and I'll get rid of this s prime here. So now we know that the heuristic is just consistent. That's that's all we know about it. In that case, h s must be less than or equal to h s prime plus the cost from s to s prime. And so what do we know about, about h s prime? Well, we know that h um, h s prime, which is h s here in, in this case, is less than or equal to um, h star of s, which is c. Right, so, so in this case, h of s is less than or equal to h star of s prime plus c of s of s prime. And we'll say that the cost from s to s prime is, we'll call this c1. And so given that h star of s is equal to c, then we know that h of s is less than or equal to c plus c1. But now, what is c plus c1? c plus c1 is equal to h star of s, given that s is here. Yeah, I, I should have just used different different state terms, like I call it S0 and then S0, but uh, just know that these H star of S's are just referring to when each of these instances was S like on their own and their S prime was just their, their, their neighboring state. But we have this H star of S here, which then in that case, we'd say that H of S given that the state is here, is less than or equal to h star of s. And so we could prove this um, through mathematical induction. I 
I, I assume I haven't gone through the proof. It might be a good proof to, to possibly go through. Might be a bit maybe a bit more complicated. I actually should go through on my own too. Um, but we can see here that we can we can keep this this chain continuing, right? And it, and keeping this chain continuing, um, this is a part of of like mathematical induction process. And so we can see that that for every single state here, just by assuming that that the heuristic is consistent we could also imply that it is admissible. And what we are essentially saying is that if the heuristic, so let me drag this down over here, if the heuristic is consistent, then the heuristic is admissible in terms of symbolic logic we'd say if oops, if it's consistent forgot the T if it's consistent that must imply that it is admissible And so now it's really cool because if we want to show that a heuristic is both consistent and admissible, and you'll see why um, it's important for us to maybe figure that out um, later, we can see that that um, all we need to do is show that a heuristic is consistent. And by showing a heuristic is consistent, we will be able to infer that it is also admissible. At the same time, if we show that um, through the, if I remember correctly, is the contrapositive. We can show that if a heuristic is not admissible, then that must imply that it is not consistent. So if we show that a heuristic is consistent, we know that it is both consistent and admissible. And at the same time, if we know that a, that a, that a heuristic is not admissible, then it is both not admissible and not consistent. And that's really like that's two really cool things that that we can figure out because it will it can save a lot of work when trying to figure out if a heuristic holds these properties um, because because for our search methods, you'll see that it's it's important for for a heuristic to hold these properties for the search methods to work properly to give optimal solutions. And so finally, now that we've kind of talked through this he uh, heuristic and what exactly it is and what it represents and how we can maybe form one, let's now finally look through our informed search methods or our heuristic search methods. Let's zoom in. Let's specify the informed search methods. And there's only really two that we're going to go over. And that's going to be the greedy and in parentheses best first search. There really isn't an abbreviation. And also, there's also the A star search. And so let's first go over the greedy best first search algorithm. And so let me make a state space graph here. I think that's good. And so for each of these, I'm going to actually zoom in a bit more. There we go. And then for each of these, I'm going to write an associated H value. Um, 
Well, first let me specify a goal. Say this is the goal state, and this is the start. And let's give each of these actions a value. Say eight, seven, I can cut to when I finish this. All right, so given our state space graph, we're gonna go ahead and do the greedy best for a search algorithm. And so it's a really simple algorithm to follow. For greedy best for a search, all we're gonna wanna do is move to the state with the lowest h value. That's it. And so since we're starting from up here, we actually don't care about the h value here because we're only just looking at these values, these h values first. What we're gonna do is we're gonna move to the lowest h value and so that's h is equal to four here. And then from here, we're gonna look at the next two values and then we're gonna move to h is equal to zero here. And so, this um, this case would be just a straight shot. Um, and so let me actually give these states some names. And I can just do it alphabetically. A, B, C, D, I'll go E, and then F. And so in terms of our expansion order, it would just be as simple as we would first, of course, expand A, our start, and then we would move to C because C has the higher H value, and so we would expand C, and from C we would move to the higher H value, in which that would be E. And our path order is just the same as our expansion order here, which would be A, C, and E. But this isn't as satisfying, uh, and it would be much better if we have uh, if we have a case in which we're maybe uh, looking at, at 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 more nodes. And so let's go ahead and create that. And so now um, all I've really done is just change the heuristic values, the fours and the fives here. And so now we'll see that from our start, A, let me actually go ahead and erase this. From our start, A, we're gonna move to our lowest. Of course, we're gonna need to expand A first in order to then see that, okay, the next lowest value for H is gonna be B. And we're going to expand B, allowing us to see these two new, no, um, new nodes, and we see that the lowest value we have is F. And then from F, once we expand that, we see the only really node we can expand to is going to be E. And so we see the path again is just really the expansion order is the same as our path order. We go from A to B to F to E. And the reasoning for this is because is because if a heuristic is giving us some value that like isn't infinity um, or isn't like say if we specify something if a heuristic is a negative value it means that it does not reach a goal at all. Um, if, if that is the case, then of course us always going to the lowest value heuristic, assuming that there is a solution, 
us going to the lowest value will always bring us directly to the goal. Right, As assuming that, I, I guess, as assuming that we have a heuristic that is consistent and admissible, right? Because, we, because then we would always have our H values decreasing further and further until until we reach the the goal right greedy best first search wouldn't really work if um i, I was i was gonna say it, it, it wouldn't really work if if uh the heuristic wasn't admissible but i think it, it still would be the case um but but it would just take um a, a, a few more steps so let's actually let's actually look at the at a case in which a heuristic is not um admissible or is not a uh, um consistent and so let me go ahead and, and put that right now all right so now we have here a a heuristic which kind of come makes no sense uh at all right because for instance here you have an h value is equal to 11 and then if you move over here the h value is three but the cost to move is only seven but from three if you move over here now the h value has increased to, to nine and then when you only do a, a cost of, of three for an action then you get to the goal state of zero there's a lot of parts that don't make sense in here but this can be a a possible state space graph that you may encounter if your heuristic is is poorly made and so now the question is how do we make a greedy best for a search algorithm that can still handle searching through this case and so if you've seen a connection here um you you might connect this to the uniform cost search in which now the the cost that we're using is going to be the H values instead of the G values, right? Because, because if you noticed the G values here, like, like, um, I guess the G value here would be like adding these two. We were, we were, um, we were using the G values for, for the, uniform cost search from before um, um, but in the greedy best first search algorithm we we aren't using the g values or I should say even like the cost values at all right we're just using the h values and so if we want to make a generalized greedy best first search that's suited for any algorithm or my bad that's suited for any state space graph then we can take a similar approach as the um, uniform cost search. And that is going to mean that, let me see, uh, I'm going to erase this here. And that means that the data structure that we're going to need to use is going to be a priority queue in which the pairs we're taking into the queue are going to be a state followed by the h value of the state basically the 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 heuristic estimating that 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 state and just to note again the h of the state is going to be the estimated cost from the state to the goal Right. And so we're going to do a similar approach to uniform cost search, except now we're going to just to only take into account the heuristic. And so, of course, we're going to start with H and 11 or A, A which has an H value of, of 11. And we're going to put this at the front of the queue. And let me also drag this down because I need more room. There we go. And so now that there's nothing within the the priority queue here, let's expand A.
And once we expand A, we're going to get B with value of 5 and C with a value of 8. And these values are going to need to be switched. All right, cool. So we expanded A. Oh, I looks like I missed one more. So we also can, when we expand A, we also get D with the value of three. So D with the value of three, which would have been bad because this actually would not it's gonna be the next one we expand, right? Because it has the lowest H value, lowest heuristic um, estimated value. So actually, let me just grab only the D term. So next we're gonna expand D. And now when we expand D, it looks like the only thing we're going to get is F. And F has an associated H value of 9. And so the next thing we're going to expand in this priority queue is going to be B. And when we expand B, We're going to get D with the value of 3. Oops. And we're also going to get F with the value of 9. So F with the value of 9 and D with a value of three. And so there is there is actually, actually I, I was gonna say something about this repeated value here in which since the H value for every single state is never gonna change, um, we don't need to worry about putting in duplicates into the priority queue, but I'm just gonna leave them in um, for for now. So let me move these terms up. Slide this over so I can fit in the F9 here. All right, cool. So then we expand. D3, and so actually let me move D over here to expand it. Remove that, and when we expand D, the only thing we're going to get is another F9 term, F9. And so after that, the next thing we're going to expand is going to be C. And so when we expand C, see we're going to get E and D. And so I'll just write D first because you'll see what's going to happen. D3 put into the priority queue. It's going to go to the front. And then we have E0. But similar to before, we're going to have an is goal condition to check whether or not this new state that we're going to put in the priority queue is a goal or not. And if it is true, we expand and we finish. So it is true. So then we expand.
And that'll be the end of our expansion. And so now, similar to the uniform cost search, I remember this was just a side note that I put in because um, I, I, I forgot to mention the case in which like you aren't, aren't specifying the actual values in the expansion order, but I guess this makes up for it. Um, if you aren't specifying the, the values in the expansion order, then all you need to do is do a similar process as we did for breath first search in which all we need to do is know that, okay, our goal state was E. Of course, we ended at E, so that's going to be our last thing. And then we're going to look at all the previous nodes we expanded, and we're going to get the last one we see, reading it from right to left, um, in which is a parent of E. And so we see that we have C, and C is a parent of E. Are, and are there any others? D is not a parent. B is not a parent. D is not a parent. A is not a parent. All right, cool. So the next one is C. And then from C, we look at all the nodes reading from right to left and get the last instance of a parent node. We see D is not a parent of C, B is not a parent, D is not a parent, but A is a parent. A is a parent. And we see that A is the start node, and so then we don't need to look at any more um, uh, parents because A, A, A is where we started. And so the path order for the greedy best for search would be from A to C to E. But you can see how this process gets really weird, and you can see how how for here, um, since since the H values is always constant, we can run into some really bad cases in which we um, are running the search forever. Right? Like, say if we have a self loop, right? A self loop is already just one case in which if we had a self loop at at H3 here, we would we would just keep keep expanding um, the node D. Uh, we would like the, the, the expansion order here would be A to D to D to D and then to D and to D and it would just keep keep going on because because we have a heuristic that is not consistent and not admissible, right? And so that's some importance of having heuristics that are consistent and admissible. You're always guaranteed for your informed searches to be to be complete, in which that if there's a solution, they will find it. But there, there's also the question of like optimality, whether or not like the 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 search method is optimal or not and you can probably already see here that greedy best for search it is not optimal and we can see actually in in a case uh, actually a really simple case and so now for this case uh, let me actually write down h is equal to zero here and now for this case, we have a case in which the heuristic is admissible and it is consistent. And we can go ahead and actually just show that the heuristic here is, is consistent. And if it is consistent, again, remember, if it is consistent, it must imply that it is admissible. And remember, to show consistency, we can either do... Um, one of two methods that, that I like to do. One is to show that we have non-decreasing um, f values within the sequence, and another is to show from the, the the difference between h of s and h of s prime is is less than or equal to the the total cost to get from the one state to the other. Um, let's go ahead and try out both methods because this is just a really simple um, um, state space graph. So. For, for this beginning state here, we have g is equal to 0 and h is equal to 100. So in that case, f is equal to 0 plus 100, and that's 100. Now for this case here, we have g is equal to 10. 
that means f is equal to g, which is 10, plus f, 90, that's equal to 100. And even though these f's are similar here, um, remember, f just needs to be non-decreasing. So, so as long as this value is, is not greater than this value, or I should say another way to say it, as long as this value is not less than this value, then we're good to go. And 100 is not less than 100, so the condition still holds. For here, um, if we're going down this sequence on the right-hand side, g will be equal to 110, and h will be 0, and so f will be equal to 110 plus 0, which is 110. And so again, f is not decreasing within the sequence. And so the right-hand side, we're good to go. And so let's look at the left-hand side. So for here, we have g is equal to 1,000, f is equal to 1,000 plus h, which is 9, that's equal to 1,009. So we're doing a jump from 100 to 1,009, which is good. This is non-decreasing. And so then next, looking at this left-hand side, g would be equal to 1,010. And then h is 0. So then f is equal to 1,010 plus 0, which is just 1,010. And so you can see on this left-hand side, we're going from 100 to 1,009 to 1,010. And so f is non-decreasing in the sequence. And so therefore, the heuristic is consistent. And therefore, if it is consistent, it must be admissible. But let's do another way to show this. Right, so let's get rid of all this work. Whoops, backtracked a bit too far. All right. And so now for this case, we actually don't need to calculate the g's. And so I I actually like this what this this method because it's a bit easier in terms of the calculations, in which we're pretty much just checking every single. I guess you you can think of it as arrow. Right. Instead of instead of calculating like all sequences, you're just looking at each individual action within the the, the um, state space graph. And so for this action here, we want to see. Okay, j just as a also a reminder, um, what we're trying to look for is that the heuristic at s minus the heuristic at s prime is less than or equal to the cost from s to s prime, right? I guess I'll, I'll use the full notation. The cost from s taking action a to s prime, right? Pretty much the difference from s to s prime, um, the, 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 the difference in the heuristics must be less than the cost, um, less than or equal to the cost that it takes to get there. All right, so let me try to see if I can slide this out of the way. Put it like right there. So let's look at this 1,000 arrow first. So we have 100 and we have 9. So we want to check 100 minus 9. Is that less than or equal to 1,000? Well, yes, because 91 is less than or equal to 1,000. And we're good there. Try to see if I can, I want to associate it with the arrow, but it's going to be hard to fit. I'll just squeeze it in like right there. And so now for this arrow here, this one right here, we want to check is 100 minus 90, is that less than or equal to 10? Well, yes, it is because 10 is less than or equal to 10. And so this arrow is good to go. Next, we'll check this arrow right here. Is 90 minus 0 less than or equal to 100? Yes, it is because 90 is less than or equal to 100. 
So that's good to go. I'll put little check marks. And the last arrow to check would be this one right here. And so we need to check, is 9 minus 0 less than or equal to 10? Yes, it is, because 9 is less than or equal to 10. And so now this arrow is good. And now we've checked every single arrow within this, um, within this state space graph. And since they all satisfy the condition, we know that this heuristic is consistent. And since it is consistent, then it must imply that this heuristic is also admissible. Right? So this big, long answer, or big, long, I guess, or this, this all this work, I should, I should say, just to show you one simple thing about why greedy best for search is not optimal. And the reason simply is because you'll see here that in terms of our greedy best for a search, I'm not gonna do the whole priority queue thing. I'm just gonna just follow the rule of greedy best for a search, which is go to the to the state with the lowest h value. What greedy best for a search will do is if I start here and my goal is here, then I'm gonna start here. I'm gonna compare h equals nine versus h equals ninety. Well, I'm gonna go to h is equal to nine. And then from here, I have no other choice but just to go to my goal here, and that's it. And we can see that the, that the path we've generated is the left-hand side. However, if we can already see that the left-hand side would generate 1,000 plus 10, this would be 1,010. But the right-hand side is more optimal with only a cost of 110, right? 10 plus 100. So what gives? Well. It, the reason is because of the fact that the algorithm is greedy. It's only just looking for the best um, heuristic first, right? We don't care about, about the cost of the path it takes to get to the initial state. We just want to get to the state that gets us as close to the goal as possible uh, at first. And because of that, we can run into cases like this in which we're first passing along a path that costs a 1,000 uh, and not even taking it into account in the algorithm at all. And so... And so because of this, let's then look at a star search, which is both optimal and complete, given that we have a heuristic that is that is consistent and admissible. And so I'm going to go ahead and get back that previous um, state space graph that we had before, and I'll cut to that. So now we are back to our previous state space graph that we've had before in which our heuristic here is both consistent and admissible and so I'm not gonna show like all the other cases like I did with with greedy but I will use the um, data structure to show the flow of the a star search um, but before jumping into that we need we, we need to talk about what exactly is the method we're, we're working with for a star and for a star search it's pretty simple. Um, for the uniform cost search, we were grabbing the best G values. For greedy best for a search, we were grabbing the best H values. And so now A star search takes into account both of those, and it's going to grab the best F values. And so for A star search, we want to get or not get I shouldn't say get we, we're gonna we're gonna go to the states with the and when I say best um, I'm actually saying the lowest F of at that state values Right, And so because of this whole idea of getting the lowest of certain values, you've seen it in uniform cost search and you've also seen it in greedy best for search. Um, for A star search, the data structure we're going to use, as you may have guessed, is going to be the priority queue. So we're going to have a priority Q. 
queue here, entering in through the back, exiting through the front. And so, yeah, let's get started. So each of these, it looks like we're going to need to calculate the associated F values as we go along. Um, but we'll worry about those when we get to that. But of course, starting off, the G value is always just going to be zero. And so the F value, I'm not going to show the calculation, but just remember that F, of Z, that F is equal to, might as well write it here. F is equal to G plus H. Always remember that. And so, and you can always think of it as F stands for finish. Um, so it's basically how much you, how much you would finish with if you pass through a certain state. G is your gain, and um, your gain, basically, how much do you gain from the start to a certain state? And H is your heuristic, your guesstimate, how much do you estimate you will get if you go from a state to the goal? Right, just a little overview, uh, review of that. So for F here, F is going to be 7 plus 0. It's going to be 7. And so in our priority queue, we're going to put A, comma, 7 into here and of course we're just starting with this state so it's the first thing we have and we're going to expand it it's going to be the only thing we can really expand and when we expand that we're going to get two values one is going to be b we're at b we have g is equal to 5 other is going to be c c we have g is equal to 8 this is going to give us for B, it's going to be F is equal to 5 plus 5, which is 10. And for C, it's going to be F is equal to 4 plus 8, which is 12. And so we're going to have B, 10. And also we're going to have uh, C, 12. Um, and ah, I always forget the... Um, this middle value here, so luckily I didn't forget this. Uh, we're also going to have D here, which we have G is equal to 7, and F is going to be equal to 5 plus 7, which is 12. And we're also going to have D, 12. Luckily we put in that order, because we'll just define through ties, we'll have um, the the state that comes first alphabetically com comes um, gets entered into the priority queue first um, before the before the other um, state. But regardless of that tie, it's not going to matter because we have B here with the lowest value of 10, and so we're going to expand B. And so now if we expand B, we see we're going to get D here, in which D here actually has a new G value g is equal to 5 plus 1, which is 6. And that means we have a new f value, which is 6 plus 5, which is 11. And so let me go ahead and erase this first. And so now we have d, comma, 11 into here. And we also have the second state that we can look at, which is going to be f, which has a g value of 5 plus 2 which is 7, and an f value of 7 plus 3, which is 10. And so we have f comma 10 here. And so now, of course, we're going to be able to expand f. Because it does have the lowest f value. I guess ah, that, that, that's a little bit confusing. Um, just remember, yeah, I'm talking about when I say when I say f has the lowest f value, I mean state f has the lowest um, f um, f function value. Yeah, that was my bad on on that. I should have renamed that state, but it's too late now. Um, and so and so once we expand f. Right here, right? We're going to have a g value for e is equal to, to this g value 7 plus 3, which is 10. 
and that's going to give us an f value of 10 plus 0, which is just 10. And so we're going to have e comma 10. But remember, we still have that is goal state. And if it's true, we expand and stop. We also expand and stop. That's also in the form state. So is e a goal? Yes, it is. OK, it's true. So now we expand. And let me grab this, put this here, and stop. And so now we can see we're going to have an expansion order that is going to be the same as our path order. Um, but if we want to just still keep the method of first going through the expansion order consistent, the way we, be, we would do it is we would first, of course, have E here. And so E would be at the end of our path order. And then we would look at all previous nodes within this expansion order and get the last occurrence, looking, reading from right to left, um, that is a parent of E. So the parents of E are C and F. So I see an F right here, C, B, and A, and that's it. So I'm going to write F. Now from F, I do the same thing. The parents of f are d and b. So looking, reading right to left, I, I see a b. OK, cool. That's one of them. Now is there another b here, or is there like a d? And nope, there's not. And so I'm going to write b here. Now from b, the parent of b is just a. Let me just make sure there is an a over here. And yes, there is. So that's a. And that's it, because a is a, a, is a start state, and so I'm not going to I'm not going to need to look any further back, right? Because I'm always going to start my path at the start state. And this would be my path order here. And so that would be the A star search. And so let me, I, let me just make sure I do reiterate this again. A star search is optimal and complete. Is optimal and complete only if your heuristic is admissible and I could say, um, whoops, yeah, I'll just say. Um, admissible and consistent. And that's a little bit off the screen there. What I was going to say before is remember, since if something's consistent, it must imply that it's admissible. So if you really want to shorten this definition, pretty much what you could say is that is that the the A star search algorithm is optimal and complete only if the heuristic is consistent. And that's because if something is consistent, it must imply that it is also admissible. And all right, so that does it for the inform search. And for these search methods that we've looked through. And so now as the one last bit that that we looked through this week, that's going to be our optimization problems, a new type of problem. And so moving on from our our search problem, the next problem within within um, artificial intelligence that, that we were looking at is optimization. And so optimi an optimization problem, which we didn't really focus too much on uh, this week, just kind of briefly went through it. Um, so this isn't going to be like a really formal definition, but but if you're familiar with optimization problems, all we're really looking for is finding 
uh, not local, it can also be global, maxima, or minima. Basically finding some maximum or minimum values within within some function. And so a way you can think of this, it's, it's similar to search. Let me write similar. It's similar to search problem, but we only care about the goal, not really the path. Right? We don't care how we get there, just get us to a a local or global maxima or minima, right? And so the main search method we focused on for optimization problems is local search. And for, for local search, there were, there are many more search, um, search algorithms or search methods, but the two we focused on were, were hill climbing and gradient descent. Hopefully I spelled descent right, not too sure. And if you want to think about where this local search fits into, I can, um, oops, I can scoot this flow chart down because we can treat this as another branch within our search methods in which we have the informed search. We also have the uninformed search. And we also have the local search. And so for local search, I'm not going to spend like a vast amount of time like talking about everything because I also don't feel too confident in, do in doing so. I'm just going to give a brief overview of, of each algorithm. Um, but in essence, for, for hill climbing, what you're really doing is you have some function like this and given some start point within here so let's just be like some function of x do not confuse this with the f of state this is not what this is this is this is just a regular function you're used to in any in any math class and so what hill climbing will do is you will essentially just look at at neighboring points that are just a a certain certain values away um, and so we can just say i don't know just like one unit away and what we'll do is we'll move to the point with a higher value and so then we'll move to here. And then we'll look at the points that are one value away. 
one value away here. And so from here, we move to here, here we move to here. And then we look at another one, one point away. And so we look at the two neighborings. From here, then we move to here because this has a higher, a higher value. Um, and then from this point here, we move, we look one unit away here. And then now we see that at this point here, it's two neighbors that are that are one unit away, are both less than that than that value, and so then we would say that this is our our um, maxima. And notice how I'm saying like it can be global or local because it really depends on the starting point. If you were to start here, you would slowly work your way up to the top here, and 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 get and get an actual global maxima. But since we started a little bit to the left, we've actually just got a, we got a maxima, but we got a local maxima, um, not a global. And so in terms of a, like a state space graph, like how this might look like, I'll just give this just quick example. We'll go to depth. Is now we're gonna have like an actual graph. in which each vertex is connected two ways. Oops, ah, that's kind of a bad circle. Each vertex is connected two ways. We can traverse both ways. Um, but now we have these values, let's say like one, five, three, nine, um, 11, say seven and eight. And so you can see if we were to start on this node here with the value of one, we just pretty much just want to move to the max node of the neighbors. And so from one, we move to nine. And from nine, we see, let's see, one is less than nine, seven is less than nine. And so we would stop here. That's the goal that we ended at. But we can see here, we do have this other maxima over here at, at 11. And it really just depends on where we start. Because now if I say, let's start at three here. So if we start here, we get the max of the neighbors, which is eight. So we move here. From eight, we get the max of the neighbors, which is, let's see, it's not three, it's not five, it's 11. So we move here to 11 and then we end here, and this is our goal. And yeah, that 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 that's where we would end off. And this would be we would end off at a at a at the global maxima, the the the, the maximum point from out of all the, the the state values. And so that's pretty much it for for hill climbing. You're just kind of like iterating through it. Um, um, that's it. Just just taking like equal steps. And so now moving on to gradient descent. Now this one, there is a lot of like mathematics that you can get into, which I'm not going to cover because we did not cover in the class, and so I wouldn't feel too confident talking about it. But in essence, for gradient descent, what you're doing is, let's bring back our function that we had down. Uh, let's let me uh, make it a bit neater. Yeah, and bigger too. There we go. And so if we were starting right here, similar to before, now here's here's what we're doing that's different. In hill climbing, actually, uh, I guess in gradient descent, you are focused on getting the, the minimum because you're trying to descend down a certain gradient. In hill climbing, you're trying to climb up a hill to get to a maximum, in which you're trying to get a max here and a min here. However, however, for for both of these algorithms, you can always just reverse them and have them 
get the opposite of what they're intended to do. Right. And so, and reversing it would just be as simple as just putting a negative value associated to, to some value, right? Cause, cause for hill climbing, if you're trying to get the max value, well, if you're trying to get, if, if, if you're trying to get the max value, the, and if all values are negative, then you're going to end up getting the lowest value, right? The values that are closest to, to zero. And same for gradient descent. If you're trying to get the minimum values, uh, then if you make everything negative, then the minimum of the negative, take the absolute value of that, you're going to get the the max value, the max value, the value that's farthest away from zero, right? And so, and so, but let's let's look at gradient descent. So in gradient descent, in in, in hill climbing, if we were to start something like right here, we would just take similar similar steps in 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 width and check these neighbors. And determine which ones we go to, but you can see how like that might be a problem because because right if 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 this if our steps are, are a little bit too big in, in in hill climbing, then say something like they're maybe like two units big, like this, and so we see okay this value is higher let's go here. You can see how how it, it might not be as clear here, but but there is still like a point that's a little bit higher than what where we're currently at. However, we won't get to it because as soon as we move to this point, we'll take two steps and check the point here. And we'll see that this point is actually, it's like, it looks like it's equal, but we'll just say it's like, it's like just barely less than this point. It's like just barely underneath like that. And so in that case, we would say that, okay, now this point, this is the max, and we're good to go. But it's not really the max, right? Because we can still shift over a little bit to the left and get this, this actual max point. And so gradient descent tries to fix that problem by taking into account the, the um, instantaneous rate of change all right, so I'm not sure where I'm jumping in here. Uh, I again had to look back at my class notes to make sure I'm getting stuff right because I'm not too confident on the gradient descent material. Um, but but now I have a better idea. And so essentially, essentially a way to describe the gradient descent is that it is a method for hill climbing within a continuous state space. And so the method we go about by doing that is, is by taking steps that are proportional to the instantaneous rate of change um, or the slope of where the current point is at, right? Because you expect to find the, the minimum of a value to be kind of to, to 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 have the the graphs first kind of start to to ease off or ha have the slope get less and less and less and eventually at the minimum the instantaneous rate of change should be zero right and so if i'm say at a point right here I'm going to get the instantaneous rate of change, which for this case is the derivative. Say if this is at point x, then this is f prime of x. And let me also write down this is graph f of x. Again, remember, this is f of x in terms of a function of x, not necessarily f of state x. Um, Uh, where f of state x was talking about like the g plus h that that is not the case for here this is just an actual just mathematical function and so from here we'll go along with the the negative of the gradient and so we see that we have a fairly steep slope here and so we can afford to take a big step the amount of of, of how big a step you take is described by some function which I'm not going to get too heavy into the mathematics here, and so I won't mention it here. Um, 
And so we can afford to take a big step here and go down. And we can see now we have now, we'll call this x1. And so now the the slope here is going to be a little, a little more gradual, f prime of x1. And so we'll take a step that's a little bit less. And we have a step that's a little bit more gradual. It's x2, f of x2, f prime of x2. And you can see that we're going to just take steps that are, maybe that'll make the step a little bit smaller. We'll take steps that are smaller and smaller and smaller until we get to the point in which f prime of some x n is equal to zero, which we know then we're at our our minimum, right? Because, well, even though like f prime of x being zero could be a minimum or a maximum, since we're following through with the negative gradient, um, we would expect to be at the at the um, minimum. But you can see here that that a case in which you're taking steps and slowly, slowly, slowly approaching um, um, the the minimum is only just one case, right? Because it it really only just depends on on what you can consider. If I have this term right, the 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 learning rate, or basically how much you jump from from one point to the next, right? Because you can have a case in which maybe the amount that you're jumping is really large and maybe instead of just jumping like over here you might jump way over here this in which then now you have this gradient here this will be your x1 term this is f prime of x1 and so now you follow the negative of this gradient so now you need to go backwards and so now from this jump, you might jump like here. And from here, you're almost at zero, but not quite. This is x2, f prime of x2. And you might jump a little bit forwards. And you can see you might jump back maybe again until you kind of reach that, that, that minimum. Right, and so and so there's and so there's there there are two cases here, or I should say, I should say two cases to be aware of, in which one depending on some start state here, in which you're kind of jumping too much, you might jump across here and then across here, across here, and then back, back, until you finally reach the min, in which here your, your step size or how big a step you're taking is, is too large, right? Because, because even though you are taking bigger steps, you're still going to have to look at more and more and more and more values until you finally reach the min, right? And so what you may do then is say, okay, let's 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 decrease then the the step we take. But then another problem that can occur would be if your step size is too small. And so you're kind of jumping, 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 jumping. And then as you get closer and closer and as the slope gets more and more steady you take smaller and smaller and smaller steps until you finally reach the min but even this case is is undesirable too because because you're going to be taking many many points into account and so what you really want is just you know a goldilocks rule you want something that's right in the middle something that's just right something that can maybe jump take a big step jump take a little bigger step or a little a little bit of a smaller step jump as you get more gradual jump over maybe you might jump over um the point in which then you have to kind of go back 
And then once you go back, you kind of get that minimum there. So that you can find the minimum in as kind of few steps as possible. And now just something to be kind of weary of um, is that if your step size is too, too, too large, you might have something um, weird happen in which you'll jump above from where you started and now over here maybe the slope is even even larger than before and so you take an even larger step back and you end up like right here and now that you've ended up right here since this is a a positive slope which means you went ahead in the negative gradient you want to jump to the left you might jump left over here and you're pretty much let me actually redraw the the arrow you might jump over here in which is just some point of this graph maybe this graph just asymptotically approaches the the x-axis in which now you're kind of just going to be stuck by just this 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 slope that is that is never it's never zero but it's just going to always be getting flatter and flatter and flatter and so you're just going to keep jumping to the left and so you can be stuck in stuff like this if your step size is too too large but this won't be the case if your step size is ever too too small if it's too too small you just have to just do a lot a lot of checks but if it's too large you might get stuck in like this infinite like loop type case in which you're just kind of going along something that's just asymptotically approaching the um the x-axis um, and so yeah, just yeah, you want something that's not super small, but at the same time not super large. Again, just Goldilocks rule. Something like this, 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 that, and then maybe like it might go back. That's it's fine if it, if it, if it overshoots thing and then it comes back, and then you're finding that min. Um, but yeah, in terms of of our search methods for our specifically in this case optimization our optimization problem, we have hill climbing and gradient descent. Um, but there are a lot more um, that that you can look at. But these are just the two main ones that we went through in the class. Um, but yeah, there, that was kind of a lot of material. Um, for this week but the first two weeks were kind of a lot and i think as we go through it um hopefully the videos i think i'm trying i'm trying to make them as as short as possible but i know there's just a lot of materials to cover and i want to also make sure i'm thoroughly explaining everything um so you know my goal is to try to get it like my goal is to try to get it at least below 15 minutes uh um but right now it's been like two hours and so my goal right now is to, to try to just get it under an hour um, and then maybe from there under 30 minutes, then from there under 15 minutes. But I'll get better at in explaining and summarizing as I go along. Um, but hopefully you guys appreciate the long and in-depth and in talk about it because I know I enjoy it. I know it helps me understand it. That's why I'm doing these summaries because uh, it helps me remember and learn the material as I'm trying to teach it. Um, but yeah, as always, feel free to let me know if I kind of maybe got anything wrong um, if I explained something and it wasn't as clear, um, if I was maybe just uh, something which you were just hoping I would explain but just didn't, um, any any stuff like that, feel free to leave it in the comments and then I can get to it and maybe make a whole separate video on it if if, it, if it's something I feel like it should should do or I just might kind of reply to the to the comment or if anyone has anything that they feel like I did wrong, then I can learn my mistake from it uh, and then and then maybe make a later edit or I don't know if I, there's any way I can, can directly edit the video but but yeah uh, you guys get the idea but yeah thanks for watching uh, hopefully you guys learned something new or maybe had something that was clarified for you maybe I explained something else that was um, a little bit easier to understand um, but yeah I'll see you guys next time thanks for watching Bye-bye.